So I'm honored to be here and see good friends and great. Um, so during the next 45, 50 minutes, I tell mm -hmm. you where we are and likely where we're going to go with the new guidelines that will be out next year. And I uh, prepared a couple of slides last night with new data that nobody has seen, just for you. <laughs> so uh, I should tell you that uh, we do a lot of clinical studies, and one of our inpatient studies is being supported by several companies. For good or for bad, the money goes to Emory, not to my wife. <laughs> so I will first tell you where we are on definitions, and what are the changes that were contemplated or discussed for next year. And, and I know you are researchers, and I see basic science researchers, clinical researchers, but, but for the clinicians, I want to tell you where we are with insulin, and where we are with non-insulin agents in the hospital. Okay. Currently, the guideline says insulin is the only way to do it. That all around the world is not true. So I'll tell you the, the, what is going on and the discussion that we're having in this about this. And, and this is in the green grand round, so we're going to start with two cases that I think is going to highlight where we are. And the confusion that we have in the field. So the first case is a 68-year-old male, 80-year history of diabetes present with heart failure. So the lab is not too bad, 172, hemoglobin C 7.8 for a 68 and perfect. Not bad. And the patient has mild, moderate kidney problem. The same thing, this next patient is a 42-year-old male. Again, long-standing history of fully control. It's admitted with diabetic fluid <coughs> ulcer and osteomyelitis, and it's going to require surgery. And the patient is fully controlled with the glucose close to 300, hemoglobin O1C greater than 9, normal GFR. Current guidelines would suggest that we should manage the patient in the same way with insulin and basic ball, perhaps. Is that true? So if I ask you, should these patients should be managed in the same way? And I'm sure most of you are saying it doesn't make any sense, that's right. And this is what we are lacking in, in, in the new guidelines. So let me, with that introduction, we come back to these cases. Uh, let me review with you where we are in inpatient glycemic control. We know about this epidemic of diabetes, and now we have over 30 million people with diabetes, 24 with diagnosed diabetes. And here to the right is what I want you to pay attention, is the number of people admitted to the hospital and more importantly than here, there are 14 million emergency room admissions or visits with diabetes. And a significant cost, and of course associated with poor outcome, those in the hospital. So how often do we see hyperglycemia in the hospital? And this is data for Curtis Cook from Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And when the top is patients admitted to the ICU, and the bottom of patients admitted to the non-ICU, and these are patients who require finger stick for whatever reason. 14 million people, 12 million people. And if you want, if you dis define hyperglycemia as a blood glucose greater than 180, one out of three patients have high pressure. It doesn't matter if they're in the ICU or non-ICU. So hyperglycemia is very, very common. So some of you say, well, 180 is not too bad. What about 200? It's about 23%. So it's extremely common. So, should we care? Well, it's associated with complications, that's right? And these are at least a hundred papers, observational data showing the same thing. The <laughs> higher the blood glucose, the higher the level of complications. And here you have the definition of what is hyperglycemia according to the ADA, or where we want to have the blood glucose between 140 to 180 or 100 to 180. You see that if you have 140, you get about 28% complications. You have 180, you got 30 plus percent. But you can have a blood glucose of 100 and you still have confidence. Why? Because hyperglycemia is not the cause of the confidence. It's not that your blood sugar goes to 200 and you're going to fall dead. That's not making any sense, that's right. We have patients walking around in the clinic with hemoglobin one c of 10 and they don't die. So, but in the event of ischemic event, stress, 
hyperglycemia is associated. This is an association, not causation. So this is important to realize now on the new guidelines that we're trying to push to get the blood sugars down and down and down. There is no good evidence that I will show you that having a blood glucose of 180 makes any difference to have 140 or 100. The association is there, but not causation. And there are papers like this. This is community acquired pneumonia. This is 2,500 patients with pneumonia. This is from Canada, seven hospitals in Canada. So what you see in here in blue is, is mortality, in yellow and orange is hospital complications. The higher the blood glucose, higher complications, higher mortality, when the glucose is somewhere around 180 to 200. From our group, we published similar data. This is surgical patients, general surgery. So this is the non-cardiac, the gallbladder, the knees, diabetic flu infections. In, in red is patient with no diabetes, in yellow patient with diabetes. And if you have perioperative periods in 3,200 people and patients, you say, yeah, diabetes hyperglycemia is associated with increased rate of complications. And let me see, check again. The increased rate of complications, like wound infection, sepsis, UTI, whatever. So hyperglycemia definitely is associated with increased rate of complications, that's right? And, and this is the most important thing. We just got a couple of junior faculty scale work to study this problem. And, and, and here you have patient with diabetes in the left, no diabetes in the right. And what you have here is blood glucose greater than 180. And in patients with diabetes, how many blood sugars greater than 180 is associated with increased complications, death, infections? No question. But look what happened in non diabetes problems. Non diabetic. So, this is what is called stress hyperglycemia. Most of these patients are not treated. And they just have glucose in the 180, 200, and tomorrow is 140. And if you look at the rate of complications, it's significantly higher than those patients with diabetes. And we have no idea what makes somebody to go high. If it's one, twice, or multiple episodes, or if you have a recurrent episode of hyper, stress hyperglycemia, why the do they die two or three times more? So hopefully we get data in the next couple of years, but this is an area that has not been studied. Nevertheless, what I interpret from this data is that hyperglycemia is important in patients with and without diabetes. And the higher the blood glucose, the higher the rate of complications. So, what do the guidelines say? The guidelines say that, yeah, you should do a blood sugar testing that everybody needed to the hospital. And in patients with no history of diabetes, we define stress hyperglycemia as a blood glucose greater than 140. Why 140? I don't know. Should it be 160? It can be 180? We don't know. But what we want is that if the blood sugar is greater than 140, you should do testing. Because repeated episode of hyperglycemia or stress hyperglycemia, I already show you, is associated with increased mortality, increased complications. And if somebody has a repeated episode greater than 140, you should do a hemoglobin A1C. At every hospital, 6.8% of patients with no history of diabetes, with blood glucose greater than 140, have diabetes according to the hemoglobin A1C. So I think this is good in the way that you recognize about 7% of patients that they didn't know they have diabetes, then they come to the hospital. And if you have diabetes, we says do monitoring. We don't know how often you have to monitor. We says do before meals and at bedtime. Uh, do you need bedtime? Uh, there is a lot of controversies about this. So the other thing that is clear that we change is the guy is the target. Right? Since 2009, <coughs> the, we say keep the blood sugar pre meals or fasting less than 140 and random less than 180. Uh, two years ago, with the American Diabetes Association, the standard of care, we changed that. And we say now keep the blood glucose less than 180. Uh, uh, we have very good data now suggesting that it doesn't matter if it's 140, 180. Just keep it less than 180. In the ICU, 
which says 140 to 180. But in the floor, we say less than 140. Uh, why does we have this difference? So we decided to unify those criteria. People are very unhappy with this, but uh, unfortunately, no, there is no good data. I, I think that less than 180 is good enough. In our hospital, we use 70 to 180 or 80 to 180, I would go on. And we try to shoot for the minimum. But you have to individualize care, that's right. The first patient that I presented to you versus the second patient. Should they achieve the same glucose target? It, maybe no, that's right. The heart failure, the elderly person, more ill, kidney failure. Maybe a more, uh, not as, uh, so intensive control may be appropriate. That's right. So this is area that we need to change in the guidelines that we do with you and next year. <coughs> so, how we met, yeah. So, you say there's no data, but there's data from treatment of COVID, so, unfortunately, improvement of open and flat is Yeah. No, no, no question that, that Chris Vandenberg in 2001, the first paper, and then she says that 80 to 110 should be the goal. Everybody had been frustrated because nobody was able to reproduce this data. We have a large studies in cardiovascular surgery, and we published last year, two years ago, that it doesn't matter if you do 100 to 140, 140 to 180. So why is that? Because Green Vanderberg's paper, 70% of her patients were stress hyperglycemia. So in patients with stress hyperglycemia, if you treat to 100 to 140, you do reduce complications compared to patients with diabetes. So ICU is, is, is current data would suggest that less than 180 should be okay. Uh, around the world, uh, some studies even show that if you go for 80 to 110, you kill more people. So, so I think that Greek data is debatable. Uh, we can talk about the Greek data, it's more ICU. She gave total parental nutrition to most people. And if you produce hyperglycemia, like I show you in the right, in the left, in, your, in the right side, um, it's bad. So, insulin is recommended. And we said, <coughs> don't use oral agents, or not generally recommended. And the reason why we said that is because we didn't have data. That's right. But this is changing, I hope. So, the current recommendation for fellows or uh, we say stop oral agents, and you should keep 0.3 to 0.5 units total daily dose of insulin. Somebody like me, somewhere around 15 to 30 units of insulin. That's what I'll do. And you give half basal half bolus. And if you're elderly, that's that's another area of discussion. But how do you define elderly? Maybe frailty is a better word to use, not just a categorical age. However, in our unit, we are over 70 years old. And renal insufficiency. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm sure I'm not offending anybody here. 75, yeah. Uh, uh, renal insufficiency, okay? Uh, if the GFR is less than 60, we use 0.3. Otherwise, we do 0.4, 0.5. And it doesn't matter if you use 0.4 or 0.5. It doesn't change at all. So uh, if I'm 75 <clears throat> or 80 kilos, about 32 units would be okay. So it's half base or half. The other thing, and I will present data for these guidelines, is that if you have taken a patient with, have been taking insulin at home, when they come to the hospital, you should reduce the dose of insulin. It doesn't matter if you're hyperglycemic. And the reason why we do that is because if you do not reduce the dose, the rate of hypoglycemia is about 20 to 30%. If you reduce the dose, it's about 8%, 10%, and there's no difference in the hospital than glucose control. So why did you need to change the data? Because when you are in the hospital, you're sick, you don't eat. The average caloric intake in Atlanta, Georgia, is 1,380 calories per day. And they have a BMI of 31 or 32. So they're just not eating. I mean, remember the last time that you had a cold? I'm sure that you're a little bit heart failure or short term, shortness of breath, you're not going to eat the same. 
So we want you to consider cutting down the dose to prevent hypoglycemia. I'll show you something. And we say do basal bolus, which is very complicated to a lot of places. So you have to give one base of the insulin and insulin before meal plus correction. So, so where did this complicated regimen came from? Okay, so here you have, this is the, the first study that we did. We just did sliding scale. The way that people had managed patients is 1930. So the first person in the world that I believe wrote for sliding scale was Elliot P. Johnson from the Johnson Clinic in the third manual of the Johnson Clinic. And what he did at that time, they had glycosurin. And what he wrote is give five units for one plus glycosurin, 10 units for two plus, 15 units for two plus glycosurin. That's what they were in 1932. So if you look at the literature from the 1932 to the 1970s, everybody complained about urine, that glycosuria is not a good representation of blood glucose of the patient. Not there are that many things, right? And so there was a lot of hypos and convulsion. So in the 1970s, Jay Skyler, Itachi, uh, Leroy wrote for these uh, sliding scales using finger sticks. And everybody jumped to finger sticks. And sliding scales is the number one way that we manage patients around the world. So we says let's do basal bolus versus sliding scales. Simple. And, and we got, we stopped the oral agents, and one group, they were taking oral agents, uh, we gave 0.4 or 0.5, uh, we gave half basal, half bolus or prandial insulin. And if the blood glucose was between 140 to 200, we gave 0.4, more than 200, 0.5. That's the way, this is the MOE recipe. Uh, and, and we compared to these sliding scales that had been in the units in 1995 that have been a great run in the diabetes program. So three sensitive, useful, if you eat, you go here. If you don't eat, you move here. And if you are very obese, you go to the last one. Okay, simple, but you can get between two to 18 units before each meal. Okay, it's possible. Yeah. You know, this, this is actually really interesting compared to what we are currently doing on our patient side. But this was just for the type two population. Yeah, type two. Okay. And, and this is what we reported. That's right. Here you have blood glucose. If you do sliding scales alone, glucose will drop a little bit, but it hangs around 180 to 200. So above that what we want. But if you do basic balls, you really improve rapidly the blood glucose concentration in this patient. So we said, yeah, it's better. And if you look at the rate of hypoglycemia in these non-insulin type 2 patients, half were done in and then we have it done in Miami. There is no different hypoglycemia. So we said now we have a randomized trial that says that basal bolus is better than slider scales, and we shouldn't use slider scales alone in the hospital. Okay, good. That was everybody has been complaining for the last 70 years. So, but can you reduce complications? Then bringing the blood sugar down is easy, that's right. We can do reduce complications, so we decided to go to the surgery area. And we took uh, 200 patients and we randomized them. They were treated with oral agents or low dose insulin, less than 0.4 or 0.5 units per kilo. And we randomized half to basal bolts, same protocol, half to sliding scales. And what we wanted to do is complications. So we did a composite of complications. And we lumped together wound infections, pneumonia, respiratory failure, acute kidney injury, or bacteria. We just put it there. And blood sugar was better, sure. But this is the, if you treat surgical patients, if you treat with sliding scales, the glucose is 180, 200, but they had big swings, ups and downs, of blood glucose. You had three times or two or three times more complications. Here you have you treat with basal follows versus sliding scales, especially acute kidney injury and wound infection. So we say, ha, now we have evidence that basal follows is better than sliding scales in reducing complications in surgical patients. This is general surgery, not cardiac surgery. <coughs> and, then, and we also did some financial analysis 
And you save about a thousand dollars per case because of the complications. So it says now we have good evidence convinced to use the, the things, right? It, at the doctors, surgeons have taken this? Not at all. So I have two doors. One is a now it's back at Emory, it's just a train here in New York and Columbia. The OBGYN, number one form that they treat is slightly scales. The other is a, a orthopedic surgery resident at the Cleveland Clinic, and they just only use slightly scales. Okay, despite that they grew up in my house. Okay. They now have convinced them that they give 0.2 units per kilo is enough for them. But anyway, so the other thing is that, so we use only analogs. What about MPAs and regular? That's right. I grew up in Ecuador, but people say, you know, these analogs are very expensive. And many areas in the world, they just use MPAs and regular. So we wanted to do, we've done three studies to determine how good are MPAs and regular, $25 versus $200 a bottle. Okay. And, and the, the first study, we call it Dean trial, and we compare the uh, NPAs and regular in the base of bolus approach versus Vedomir uh, and aspart. And here's the blood glucose concentration, it's no different. So, and it's very similar to the preview. So why is that? Because this is treat to target. If I give you a target and you have to increase the insulin, you're going to achieve the same blood glucose control. Simple, that's right. It doesn't matter what insulin you use, you're going to achieve similar glucose control. Uh, but we said, well, maybe Vedomir is not good. So we, we repeated this study with large and you know, glycine, base of bullet versus MPAs and red. This study was done in South America and Paraguay. And there is no difference in glucose control. But there is difference in hypoglycemia. So if you use MPAs, you do have a little more severe hypoglycemia, especially in surgical patients. So we say, yeah, there is a little benefit of using a glargine or thetamir or deglutin versus MPAs in reducing severe hypoglycemia, but overall glucose control complications is the same. What about 73? So there are countries like China, eh, Pakistan, some Africa, Spain, and Atlanta, Georgia, we use 73. So, in the community hospital in, in Atlanta, 19% of my patients are on 70 and 30 because there are 32% of them have no insurance. So what do you do with 70 and 30? So I don't know if you guys use 70 and 30, some hospitals do not. But we says, can we use 70 and 30? So we did a study in Spain, and here you have, if you treat 70 and 30, in Spain it's called 37, uh, versus basal balls, no different because it's a treat to target, so you increase the dose. Uh, but if you look at the rate of hypoglycemia, if you use a uh, 70 30, then the rate of hypoglycemia is over 50 percent. So, why? Because we include a surgical patient. So, the recommendation <coughs> next year is going to say, and last year the same, it's going to say, be careful when you use 70 30. If the patient is not eating well, if the patient is a surgical patient, please don't use it. If you have an in and out, I mean, it, they're going to eat, maybe you can use it. Uh, uh, but too much hypoglycemia, yeah. Was the 73 in that? Was 3077? This was regular MPH. Regular MPH. And then the other question was was it EIP or TIP? So some studies utilize them together. So we did NPH twice a day yeah. and regular before meal, like a basal bolus approach. <laughs> in the <laughs> 70 30, we gave it twice a day, <laughs> two third in the morning, one third in the afternoon, the same old way the that we learned when we were in medical school. Okay. So, so if you ask yourself, what is the best way? Uh, what is the best way to control? What instrument is the best? Way? I think that the data would suggest, hands down, basal ball is better than sliding scale. Hands down. Sliding scales are gone. Too much fluctuation. Uh, can you use analogs? Yeah. A little better than MPH and regular. 
in reducing severe hypoglycemia is better than 73, but that's it. But limitations. I mean, at Emory now we have 70% of our surgical patient use in basin. But in the gravy side, surgeons still use sliding scale, like daughters do as well. And so hypoglycemia risk is there in about 10 to 18 percent of patients. And many patients complain, many doctors complain that it's an overtreatment. For example, the first patient that I presented to you, the old lady with heart failure, who was 180, should I really have to do a patient? So, so during the last few years, we have looked for alternatives. I don't like too much basal I like for type 1 diabetes. So he says, can we just keep basal, or what we call basal plus, or basal plus in Spanish. The one basal plus correction if needed, simple, one shot a day. Can we use incretination? And I pres we presented some, we have like 700 patients with dp 34 and I will present to you a study we just concluded, it's going to appear in diabetes care in the next couple of months. Uh, uh, I made this slide last night on GLP-1. So, the current recommendations for the Endocrine Society and ADA is that if you don't know if the patient is going to eat, you just give a single dose of patient. And that's the way I manage patients. So I give 0.2, 0 0.25 units per kilo, so 20 units, 16 units, 24 units, once a day. And if the blood glucose is high, I do correct. And I only reserve basal bolus for people who are eating well. That's it's called basal plus. These data, these recommendations came from a study that we call basal plus. 370 patients. And half were given basal plus supplements, like I mentioned to you, 0.25 correction. If you are over the age of 70, or the GFR less than 60, or creatinine more than 2, you will reduce the dose. So somebody like me, it would get 0.25, so 20 units. That's it. And the other you give this complex half basal, half all the plus supplements. And here is the data. So if you have medicine patients to the left, surgical patients to the right, there's no difference in glucose control. So why people in the hospital don't eat much? If you don't eat much, you don't need much supplements. You don't need this half and half. And so the recommendations right now, based on this study, is that you should do basal, and you can move to basal bolus if you need so. If the patient has type 1 diabetes, you must use basal bolus in the way that they have no insulin. But a patient with type 2, if they have a little insulin on board, make endogenous insulin, they can, for the little meals that they need, should be just fine. So the other thing is DPP-4. Can we do oral agents? Hmm. The guideline says mm -mm, never. But if you go to Israel, 60% of patients are treated with oral agents. If you go to the UK, 40%. And we say no oral agent. Uh, so we started a few years ago. Says so we use metformin, kidney failure, too many lawyers, <laughs> uh, lactic acidosis. We got a friend. Uh, so we use sulfonylurea. I already told you that you don't need too much. So number one risk factor of hypoglycemia is not eating when you use sulfonylurea. Then we says can you use DPP four? Can you use GL people? So let me show you the data. Uh, so first, we did this study at Emory. How often do we have patients treated with oral agents? 24%. So patients are treated with oral agents, they come to the hospital and the doctor continue the oral agents. Uh, in other countries, much more. So, so we decided to start five, six years ago with DP people. The first study was a pilot study. Mm -hmm. We took 90 patients, the best patients in the world, okay, nine, keep normal kidney function, eating, talking to you, I did it for small things. And we gave Cetagliptin one tablet a day, one little tablet. These were patients taking oral agents at home, or insulin less than 0.5, so less than 30, 40 units. Okay. And the other, we gave one little tablet and one shot of insulin, 0.25, and the other, we gave basal balls the standard over here. Everybody got supplement. 
correction. So a C plan plus correction, all of this. So it was the uh, real estate correction. And we published this data. The guy was here. I said, Ian, I promise you, you don't know how much I doubt our, our own data. I went and looked at it. It cannot be true. A little tablet, impossible. But we realized, then we did a sub-analysis. If the blue group was less than 180, it didn't matter. It didn't, it doesn't matter what agent you use. If you use Cita Clifton, Cita plus insulin or base of But if the blue group was greater than 180, if 200, Cita Clifton was not good. So we said, okay, most people are needed with more than 180, 200. But, so we did a study that is called Cita plus basal versus basal balls. So compare these two guys. And, and the, we call it Cita Hospital, it's probably some guy that is in the Lancet and And we took patients, 280 patients, treated with uh, oral agents or insulin at a total daily dose of 0.6, so about 50 units or less. And we gave half, we gave one tablet, one shot, multiple shots of insulin. So thinking that perhaps uh, it's simpler to use one tablet, one shot, that's right, instead of multiple injections a day. And here is the data, no difference. So why? Because DPP4 works covering post branding And but it's both prandial insulin covering post prandial So there is no difference to the left is the mean blood sugar throughout the day. And to the right is blood glucose before breakfast, lunch, <coughs> dinner, and supper. Sorry, I have a yeah. question. Uh, with respect to this cohort, were these cytoglyptin plus basal insulin subjects uh, also getting supplemental? Everybody got supplemental. And how much was being administered in that? Got it. Tell you in the next slide. Got it. Okay. Uh, everybody got supplement. So the main criticism to me, of course I didn't put it in the paper, is that we didn't do basal plus. We just did based on plus right. uh, and, and here you have the total daily dose of insulin. Sure, you get less insulin, makes sense. And the supplements a day was very similar so as an average, very little supplement. And you get less injections. So we said, maybe one tablet, one shot is good for most people. But these were 80% clinical and about 14% were surgical. So we said, what about surgical patients? Hmm. So, so we did a study. They are all multi-center studies. Four centers is one of them. This is 280 patients. And we gave one little tablet of lean and uh, As you know, it doesn't need to be adjusted for kidney function. If you just give five milligrams, it doesn't matter your age or kidney function, just five milligrams. Versus basal bones, same stuff. These were patients treated with surgery, oral agents or low dose insulin up to less than 0.5, and everybody got supplement. This paper was accepted yesterday at DOM, diabetes obesity and metabolism. And here's the thing. Again, one little tablet in surgical patients. So hard to believe that, that's right. But here is the key. If you randomize patients with blood sugar less than 200, if you give linagliptin, it has the same low glucose control. If you treat more than 200, then you are over 200, and they get more complications. So the message that I took from these studies is that the average blood sugar is important. How you present to the hospital. And of course, the rate of hypoglycemia was 2% versus 12%. So, so, so we need insulin all the time. So, so we need basic walls. Likely no, that's right. I, I can tell you that this group of people, less than 180, that's where my daughters are great. If you have a patient with hemoglobin A1C less than 7, 7.5, a military hospital, well controlled, and the glucose is 150, 160, you can treat it with a PO, Flying scale, basal plus with whatever you want. And we are doing these studies now to demonstrate that. We'll go circle all the way to the beginning. That's right. and, and the good thing is that 
This is a good for the driven, which is publicity producing saxative. So we have data now with Sita, Saxa, and Lina Glyptin. And this is a medicine patient with mild hyperglycemia, same concept, in which if you treat with saxagliptin versus insulin, no difference in glucose control, and of course you use less insulin. So that's so it's good, that's right. So what about Xenotac? GLP-1. So we look for funding and the group of Xenotai, although you don't get Xenotai now short acting, we just did a study, a pilot study. We keep publishing diabetes here. And, and we took just 150 patients. They were treated with oral agent diet or low dose insulin, 0.5 units per kg. So about 30, 20, 40. And we gave Xenotai, 5 micrograms, twice taken. Xenotype with basal or basal points. So we wanted to see, gee, if I give you Xenotype with you <coughs> in the hospital, that's right. I mean, I was so scared. So 150 patients, it's a pilot study, it's medicine and surgical patients. And here is the data. So if you give Xenotype, it works from 210 to about 180. If you do with basal bolus or basal plus Xenotype, significantly better. So so it's good. That's what we anticipated. That's right. Except, but Xenotai, you know, if you say that 180 is the guidelines, most people were there. There was no difference in complications here in the body. But they you do have more nausea. And there was more patients that discontinued this uh, uh, we followed this patient for three months after discharge. And significant number of patients, when we went from 5 micrograms twice a day to 10, puke, about 14%. They have nausea, or vomiting, or discontinuous in medication. So, so can we use GLP-1? Yeah, you say, you don't have to stop it. But you get more GI side effects, as you, you suspect. Excuse me. Yes. Did you see that as uh, with exenotype, no hypoglycemia at all. None of the patients. That would be a real advantage in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, but, so if you have, this is what I believe today. And this is what is in the ADA standard of care, of course. That if you have a blood sugar less than 200, a 180 with 200, you can treat it with basal plus. That's my age. That's my favorite age. So if a surgeon calls me, yeah, we'll have a gold bladder tomorrow. Okay. What if the patient has been taken or they stop the oral agent, give 20 units of large and dead mirror, uh, whatever. And it works. And you do corrections. You can also do DPP4 and now DLP1, uh, but they are not as reliable as insulin. But if your blood glucose less greater than 200, insulin is the only way. So together with basal balls or DPP4, or that's the best way to manage this patient. So that's so far what we have, and I'll tell you the new studies in a minute. So the other thing that is interesting is what do you do at discharge, that's right? <coughs> so David goes and rounds in the hospital with a balance. A glucose 220 will increase by two units, increase by four units, cut down by two. And that's what doctors do, that's right. It, but when the patient goes to discharge, they do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so you are, you are admitted with metformin, sulfonylurea, you are discharged with metformin, sulfonylurea. It doesn't matter if you use basal bolus in the hospital. 80%, this is data from Vanderbilt. And 80% and of patients are treated with whatever they can. These patients have hemoglobin C greater than not. So 12% of patients are with heart attack are sent home with no diabetes medicines in this country. So this chart is a very weak area for doctors. So we wrote in the guidelines that we know data, of course, that if the hemoglobin was less than 7, sure, send them home with whatever they can, makes sense. 7 to 9, we say, add basal. But we didn't say how much basal, we didn't have no idea. Just add basal. And more than nine, we said send patient with basal bolus. 
So this has been around now for several years. So we decided to do the studies to see if the guidelines were correct. That's right. The other way around. Okay. And we came up with this thing. Less than seven, seven to nine, or more than nine. If it's less than seven, send it home. We just said whatever they can. Seven to nine, we said give half of the base of those in the if it's more than nine, use eighty percent. And and we follow hemoglobin A one C. And you hear it, it go from eight point seven to seven point three, so it worked. Bringing the blood glucose down. Here you go. I mean nice from nine point two to seven point five it works. But if you do this, the theory is the rate of hypoglycemia at this job is absolutely crazy. So if you send home patients with hemoglobin A1C between 7 to 7.5 on insulin, half of what you use in the hospital, the rate of hypoglycemia is 30 to 40 percent. So just remember the last time you sent a patient home. They're still ill. They're still not eating well. They're still short of breath. They're still limping around. And so insulin is good. So the problem with this this recommendation is that we send home with insulin patients with hemoglobin A1C 7, 7.2, 7.4, 7.5 who do not need to be treated in that way. So, the, what we move now is hemoglobin A1C 8 to 10, then I use insulin. So, I don't send patients home very seldom with basal bones, very seldom with type 2. I don't start insulin. Home, but we send home unless the hemoglobin will see is greater than 7.5, 8. I don't know if it's 7.5 or 8, but, but this is more conservative approach. So think carefully who you're going to send home with insulin in the way that we're doing now CGM at discharge. We're doing four studies with CGM. And if by finger sticks you get 30% hypoglycemia, imagine how many it would be with CGM. So the other alternative. Is use agents or combination of agents that are not associated with hypoglycemia. So uh, uh, this paper was published in uh, the Royce Journal, uh, uh, Cyclopentyl metformin versus insulin, and you do well. So we tend to use combination of agents now with non associated with hypoglycemia instead of sending everybody home with insulin therapy. So. I'm an insulin man, that's right. 68% of my patients in the clinic are on insulin. I do use insulin. That in the discharge area, I'm now very concerned on hypoglycemia, and we're looking now on readmissions and things like that, because it's a true thing. So, I know I presented a lot of data. So let me, let me summarize what I told you, okay? So first, with the data that I presented to you, and, and this is what I learned in the last 10, 15 years doing this type of research, they, there's definitive they shouldn't be treated in the same way. So a concept that is not out there yet, you have to individualize therapy in the hospital. So this person can be treated with whatever. Little slider scale, acetylcliptin, linagliptin, or basal glass. This patient to the right is septic, is going to go to surgery, is eating, he's just going to lose his toes, his left, okay, but his, his GI tract is okay. So he's going to eat. So this patient maybe should be treated with basal glass in the hospital. So individualization is the key to me when I decide. A, a crucial information is that, yeah, the higher the blood glucose, the higher the rate of complication. Over a hundred patients. Over a hundred patients. That is an association, not causation. It's not because your blood sugar goes up, because you go to, you're going to have complications. It says the favors complications. But we don't know the mechanism. Uh, we will know in the next couple of years why do people develop stress hyperglycemia? It's the same inflammation. Less pancreatic better cells, more insulin resistant, things like that. I finally convinced my daughter that basal bolus is better. 
Uh, so, or basal is better than slider scales. Because you get more complications. So we must tell our surgeons, we must tell our surgeons to avoid using sliding scales alone. And this is the way we should do it. Keep the basal dose. So you have a gallbladder, you have whenever amputations, when the patient comes to the hospital, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 units per cube. I use 0.2 in almost everybody. If you are very large, BMI greater than whatever, they use 0.25. It's a single dose. I stop the oral agents if I'm going to do that. And, and that works well. And no difference in complications. No difference. And blood glucose is the same. Remember, you don't need granule when you eat very little. So most people in the hospital who are sick eat very little. They, we don't have the nursing staff to feed the patients anymore. Many years ago, they're gone. That's right. So the patient, you need to feed yourself most of the time. And finally, the discharge. Uh, I think that, I don't know if it's 8 to 10, but for sure not less than 7.5. I never start somebody. I mean, I just send the patient home and ask the doctor to adjust the medication. And finally, the area of DPP4, or oral agents. I think that they can be used. They're safe, and GLP-1 is safe. They have, you know, they're not very potent. Uh, but the data would suggest in 680 patients that it worked in some patients who have less hyperglycemia. So, in the next five minutes, two minutes, I tell you where we're going and then we open for you. So, first, uh, GLP 1. I already show you this data. I just added this slide last time. Uh, should I use it? I will never start because the one thing that is hard to appreciate unless you talk to the patient is appetite. It's significant reduced appetite. And you know, you know the patient getting better until they're hungry. And this thing cut the appetite in these patients, that it was hard for us to assess appetite. Uh, and there were more discontinuation of aging. So GLP-1, if somebody is using lone acting GLP-1, the good thing is safe. Say, you don't have to be worried about it. You just treat this test. Oral agents. Uh, we're doing now a three country study uh, Israel, uh, UK, and the United States. We're getting data in about 70,000 patients who have treated with oral agents, retrospective observation, and the other retention to determine how safe they are. Uh, <coughs> we, I'm still not brave enough to do a prospective randomized study, that we have data in about 3,000 patients that we did a, a simple study in our unit, that oral agents are not associated with increased risk of complications compared to insulin. So if you have a blood glucose less than 200, they work. In our preliminary data, I've confirmed that next year. Uh, we're doing two studies with U300, David is, is the PI here, and, and because there are two new insulins, that's right, these low long insulins, the ultra long, they have less hypoglycemia as an outpatient. So, so we're doing these studies with U300 versus large NG100, David A versus large NG100, to determine how good they are. Do they reduce hypoglycemia? And, we have 160 patients on the U3, on the U3, one of them. They, there's no difference. So the preliminary data that we have, they appear to be decent in hypoglycemia in the hospital. The other thing is that a lot of concern about you have to adjust every day or every other day or every three days, every day. They are just insane. We have done two studies on prevention of stress hypertrophy. So I told you that, remember that slide that has diabetics and non-diabetics, and the non-diabetic has significant more complications. So I says, if that's the case, can we prevent the appearance of complications? I mean, can I give you a little tablet, like Cedar the day before surgery or before you are admitted, and every day, and you prevent stress hyperglycemia, 
And if you prevent high stress hyperglycemia, it can be reduced complications. So we did it in general surgery and in bypass surgery. And the answer is, what do you think? Can you prevent stress hyperglycemia? It doesn't work. It didn't work. So it was a good trial, but it didn't work. I will be famous and rich if I can do that. Ah. So, but we're working on stress hyperglycemia, and now we're doing GLP-1 injections, uh, three days before surgery, and see if we can prevent that. And finally, we're doing close loop. Uh, no, we're doing continuous glucose monitoring. So, we have four studies now using CGMs. And the question, the overall scheme of the whole project is, can you use CGM in the hospital instead of pricking fingers? Four times a day. So can a nurse go and just do this room to room to room? Or can you have a CGM in high risk patients and the glucose transmitted to the nurse station? So we had a junior faculty of VA Mary that we have designed a system in which they are at the nursing stations, they have an iPad with an alarm. So we're doing like culture monitor, glucose monitor. Can we prevent complications? So if the glucose drops below 80, it beeps, and the nurse has to do finger sticks to prevent hypoglycemia. If I believe that CGM should be the way to manage patients, some patients, some patients in the hospital, the high risk, the renal failure, the heart failure. I mean, People who really don't need to be hypoglycemia. Uh, we're doing studies in the ICU and non ICU. Uh, one study that we're doing is can you manage the same patient having four finger sticks with standard care? That's right. And you know it's not four because the nurses miss one for sure, and then so it's three or four, or two to four. Versus, I give you 288 readings today. And you go every morning. And you look the print out in your computer, and you can see the fluctuations at night during the day. Can you make a better decision on insulin management than four finger sticks? It's, I tell you in a year. I don't know, but I, I tend to believe that data is good. That's right. And maybe maybe that's the way in the future. But why do you have to manage patients with insulin with three or four blood sugar tests when you can? It's cheaper. So better than finger sticks. And of course, we're doing studies on, I haven't started, but we have the protocol in pumps in the hospital. So, it, your institution is pump territory, that's why you're in Taiwan and all these studies in Taiwan. But nobody has ever done a study how good are insulin pumps in the hospital. But we use them. I, I think we need to validate the safety and efficacy of that. And of course, the close loop, we are working with a couple of people in Europe, they calculate that's going to be. So, a lot of things going on. For the junior faculty, David is now on board. I hope that he takes this uh, area of research because there's so many areas to be done. Uh, I, I left a copy of this lecture in the computer for any one of the fellow. Uh, thank you.